want to continue what we talked about this morning. It's about God's plan uh, for male and female and his creation of human beings. We like to talk in generic terms these days. Uh, was reminded in our first hour how instructions have been given to school teachers to not refer to the uh, kids in the classes by uh, gender specific terms. Don't call them the guys, uh, call them students. Don't refer to them as boys and girls. Uh, don't say the boys will line up here, the girls will line up there. All that's gender specific uh, kind of uh, terminology. We just want to be aware of it because it's what your kids or grandkids uh, face when they go to school. Uh, not always directly and overtly. I shared with you, I meant to pull it out of my file, but I didn't. Back in the 1980s, I was given a series of pamphlets, and I've mentioned this before by uh, one of those who were in the school system, that were given to teachers to show them how they could begin to condition the kids for an acceptance and understanding that these uh, relationships of... Uh, you know, uh, homosexual kind, but not necessarily promoting the homosexual uh, practice itself, but from the early age, that these are all right. It can be two men uh, instead of a man and a woman in the fa for the family, or two women. And so these things go on, and we're not surprised it's the world. A uh, few verses, just as background, for we look at some specifics. Come to the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 14. Proverbs, chapter 14. And verse 34 is a good reminder for us. Again, part of what we are doing, much of what we do, as believers who have been called out of the world and uh, experienced God's redemption... We are instructed not to allow ourselves to be shaped by the world. And sometimes, you know, initially, early in our conversion, we're gung-ho. We want to be all out for the Lord. Um, you know, the take no captives approach. I'm going to be a testimony everywhere. And there's something refreshing about that. But over time, we can drift and, uh, you know, settle into what's called a comfortable Christianity. And sometimes even I hear churches describe, well, it's a comfortable church with a comfortable Christianity. What does that mean? Uh, well, we don't want to do anything to unsettle the waters. But the world around us is pushing on us. And they would like us to fit and uh, often we think, well, if we're going to be good testimonies to the world, we have to be accepted by the world. Uh, but no, we're outsiders bringing to them a message. But we were once insiders in this world, so we know what it's like. Remember Paul to Titus chapter 3? Remind them that they were once like them, but we're not to be like them anymore. We approach them with understanding, so it's not with the condemnation that would give the idea we are superior, although no matter how you do it, there's probably going to be a twisting of it. We don't think we are better than they, uh, that we were more worthy of God's salvation than they are. That's the beautiful thing. None of us were worthy. Um, as we noted this morning, God offers it to all. Uh, we're concerned for our nation, verse 34 of Proverbs 14. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And the more a nation becomes oh, more open, more blatant, more defiant in its encouraging and practicing of sin, uh, it's a disgrace to that nation. It's shameful. And we pride ourselves and becomes, well, shows our openness as a country and a nation. And we want to take care of people, whatever their views. Oh, well, we're well aware that uh, that's not true across the board. They're primarily concerned to promote those things. 
which at bottom line are most offensive to God. Come over to Proverbs 29. This relates to some verses we looked in other places. Proverbs chapter 29. Look at verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is he who keeps the law. Um, Sometimes that verse is misquoted as a vision. You have to have a vision, and they use it in leadership conferences and that to, to be able to lead people and have an idea how they should proceed to get where they're going. He's talking about here, and you have it in the margin of your Bible, a revelation from God. And the parallelism in that is God's law, which they had as God's word. And it is God's word, but they didn't have the New Testament and so on. But Israel lived under the authority of God's word. It's given in the Mosaic law. Where there is no revelation from God, people are unrestrained. And that's what we bring to this world. And you can see, as our country goes through what it is, without any foundation except what people themselves think, make up, feel like, we move more and more into chaos. Um, uncertainty even to the ridiculous as we talked about earlier uh, the people are unrestrained I mean there's no God in other words it's just your opinion and my opinion and I always think my opinion is better than your opinion and then it becomes might becomes right and then reading in the news here uh, Last night, today, it's on there with the destruction going on in the city. Some are saying, well, destroying property. That's not wrong. There's no bloodshed, so it's all right to destroy somebody else's property. We say, are these really intelligent people saying it? Where there is no revelation from God, I mean, how do you know a man is different than a woman? How do you know what the purpose of the creation is. Well, you make it up as you go. And the deterioration goes on. So those passages remind us of the importance of our being faithful to the word. Um, you know, once they reject the word, what kind of wisdom do they have? Um, that's what God says. They can be very intelligent, but the wisdom to apply to life and to live life out wisely avoids them. Um, but we shouldn't be shocked. We should be grateful to God that by his grace we were saved and understand it. Uh, the people think, well, you're arrogant. Uh, you think you're right. I noticed there was a church that is... Uh, uh, Recently, uh, in fact, I just saw it this afternoon, uh, not in our area, but received some destruction because they preached against homosexuality as a sin, um, offensive. Um, there's another area as well that they were involved in. Why well, don't you come to uh, Genesis chapter 19? You know, early in the scripture, not, uh, yeah, Genesis 19, the first book of the Bible, we have the issue that we're all familiar with, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, the sin of uh, the people of that city. And you had righteous Lot living there. And, uh, you know, the New Testament testified he was a righteous man, but made poor choices, end up with a family that had been influenced uh, by the corruption of the city. And uh, it, God in his grace bears the righteous, but it's a sad commentary. In Genesis 19, we have two angels coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. And what it, we're reminded in this situation, a number of things, but what is uh, clear and is true through Scripture we talked about it, remember, with Abraham. Um, they couldn't go into the land of Canaan for 400 years because the sin of the Canaanites was not yet ripe for judgment. 
And that's what's going on in the world. In God's plan, it goes on in individual nations and so on. They come and then God's judgment comes upon them, happened to Israel. And so the Assyrians came and then the Babylonians and the nation as a nation um, continued and continues to live under the judgment of God. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah have ripened for God's final judgment earthly judgment for them there is a future judgment obviously but he's going to destroy those cities the cities connected with them two angels show up and uh, as was customary uh, they went to the center of the city and uh, where the business is translated there and uh, the gate as you have in verse 1, Lot was sitting in the gate. He'd become a prominent person. It's where business was transacted. And uh, then invites these strangers come in. And this was the hospitality of time. Come to my house for the night. Um, we'll provide for you. It was an important thing to do. And you're familiar with the account. It's almost so ugly you hate to read it. Um, before they, after they ate and so on, before they could uh, retire for the night, verse 4, the men of the city, and note this, the men of Sodom surrounded the house, both young and old. Isn't that a shocking statement? Um, the, this sin pervaded all ages. I mean, the corruption was complete, if you will. All the people from every quarter wasn't like we talk about in our cities, you know, being uh, some parts of the city you don't go to. Um, Many years ago when I was uh, going to school in Center City, Philadelphia, I had to be in there at nights. But at night, there were places I didn't go. It just wasn't the place to go. Um... If anybody, you saw anybody heading that way that didn't look like they belonged there, you knew it was a dumb tourist who didn't know what they were doing. But the whole city here, they came from every quarter. This is words out. It's new men. So they come and uh, they want those men to come out and we'll have sexual relations with them. You see how... Sin had taken over everyone in the city. And Lot, and this was characteristic of the day, I, once I invite him into my house, I'd give my life to protect them. So he even offers his daughters to these men to do with as they would in place of these men. But these men want other men. You know, when sin takes over you, um, it knows no bounds. And they even, they haven't forgotten, Lot wasn't born in Sodom. So even though he's sitting in the gate and has some influence, remember he came with some wealth because he and Abraham uh, parted ways because their flocks and herds were so large, there was disagreement among the herdsmen and that. And so when somebody comes and brings their wealth, you know, they have an end to begin with. But look, in verse 9, they said, stand aside. They're telling Lot. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien. You know, he's not native here. He's an outsider. Already he's acting like a judge. I like that. That's part of what happens when we teach about sin. And, uh, well, oh, you know, you, you're the judge. You think you have the right to judge other people. No, all we do is share the judgment that God has set forth. And then they threaten him. We'll treat you worse than them. Um, uh, he stands out as different, and that's good. The New Testament said, uh, Lot, that righteous man, vexed his soul. Day after day living in that environment. Um, From the Old Testament account and just what's there, you would doubt 
the righteousness of Lot, but the New Testament under the inspiration of the Spirit testifies to that. Um, so you see what goes. Uh, when you confront the sin, now you just inflame the opposition. Oh, you think you're a judge. Oh, we'll uh, take care of you if you don't get out of the way. Kind of approach. Um, very ugly. The New Testament uses it. Peter uh, uses it in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. We looked at the book of Jude uh, in verse 7. Jude uses it as an example of the depths of depravity of fallen man, which will necessi necess necessitate and bring the judgment of God. Come over to the book of Leviticus. The law set down for God's people Israel. And sometimes when you use these passages for a subject like this, we'll say, well, that was part of the law. I thought you said we're not under the law. Those things don't apply. A lot of those things don't. But what we're seeing is the consistency of God's attitude toward this kind of sin and these kinds of sins, and they will be dealt with in the same way in the New Testament as rebellious, defiant acts against God. Uh, so in Leviticus chapter 18, come down to verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Um, verse 24, do not defile yourselves by any of these things, for by all these the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled, therefore I have brought its punishment upon it, so the land has spewed out its inhabitants. So you see, the land of Canaan had come to the point in its rebellion, its sin, its open practice of defiance of God, that now it was time for it to be dealt with. Um, Romans 2 says that those who continue in these sins are storing up wrath for themselves in the day of wrath. And the ultimate day of wrath ultimately is that final judgment. But God brings it as he was bringing it on the Canaanites. There was an immediate aspect of the judgment. Israel was to go in and what were they to do? Kill every man, woman, and child. Um, God was done with Canaan. Uh, Israel wasn't uh, as obedient as they should, but you see the instructions. Uh, well, 400 years earlier, God had told Abraham that Canaan was a land that would need to be judged, but he gives time. Um, we talked about time for salvation. No indication God sent any missionaries into Canaan. He uh, didn't send Israel in to do missionary work. He sent Israel in to do his judgment work. But there's no excuse for their sin and rebellion against God. They are accountable for it. Um, so uh, the law here is clear. It's an abomination. And the judgment that came on the Canaanites, the judgment that came on Sodom and Gomorrah, it is an example for us. The nations and peoples that persist and expand this kind of sinful rebellion and defiance of God will experience the consequences. Um, what can we expect as a nation? Um, we have had great blessing, uh, great prosperity. It has not moved us to a greater appreciation. Um, you know, we have songs connected with our nation that uh, sing about God's grace uh, was shed upon us. But um, any indication or consideration of God, we pride ourselves that we are now more open to these kinds of sinful practices and promote them. And treat as homophobic and uh, 
bad citizens if you would speak against it. Um, See how we reach a point where what is there left? Uh, The time given wasn't to use for salvation. It was used to expand sinful practices. Uh, So Canaan is an example. Come over to chapter 20, verse 13. And I'm just picking out this, the other things around them you can uh, read. Verse 13 of chapter 20, if there's a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act, they shall be surely put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. Um, We have a movement now that uh, nobody should be executed, we shouldn't execute, but the Old Testament is clear. God believes in capital punishment. What did he send Israel in the land of Canaan to do? Reform them? No. You execute every man, woman, and child. And that's true of God's judgments that come. It brings destructive. What do we see is coming for the world in uh, Revelation chapter 6 to 19? Devastating judgment from God that results in what? Billions of people dying. And all of that is an indication, reminder, there is a coming final judgment at the great white throne and sentencing to hell. Uh, God says they shall surely be put to death. Again, we are not, as the church, an earthly nation. We don't try to carry out these. Israel was an earthly nation. And as we saw, Uh, nations and the governments of nations, Romans 13, have the power of capital punishment. We do not as individuals have the authority uh, to execute vengeance. But governing powers are act as God's representative in executing. But they end up encouraging practices. And more and more, uh, we remove any punishment for the practices um, Over in Judges, chapter 19, um, you come out of the uh, books of the law and you come to Joshua, Judges. Joshua, chapter 19. And what's interesting to me here, you see where we've moved when you come to Judges, chapter 19, um, and from Genesis. We had Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the names today even are proverbial, if you will, for sin and uh, the kind of sin that brings judgment. And that's those cities' picture of a reminder, God's judgment. Then Israel comes into the land of Canaan uh, as God's nation and they are to wipe out people who have been openly defy, uh, defying God with the practice of their sin. The sad thing when you come to Judges 19, it's an Israelite, Israelite, Jewish tribe that is practicing and defending this kind of sinful practice. How do we get here? I mean, shouldn't certain things be obvious to everyone? I mean, how could Israel, God's people, Judges 19, uh, come down to verse 22. Uh, uh, Let's see. uh, 19, 22. I'm in the wrong chapter, thankfully. Here we are. Judges 19, 22. So here's a man, he went after his concubine and uh, was bringing her back and he stops and he didn't want to go into a non-Israelite city for the night because you see those kind of cities, you know, were not safe places. So they came to a tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, a city that belonged to the tribe of Benjamin and uh, Verse 14 and 15 tell you this. Uh, They were going to lodge there when the slave of this man who had retrieved his concubine suggested they stop at a non-Israelite city and uh, 
their way back to their home. They said, no, no, we'll wait. We'll go to an Israelite city. So they get to the tribe of Benjamin. They come to Gibeah. And uh, verse 15, they turned aside. They sat down in the open square of the city. Uh, no one took them in to spend the night. I mean, they didn't have hotels and things like this. So what are you going to do? Well, you go there. You're obviously a visitor, a stranger. People there, but nobody invited them into their home. But an old man comes. Uh, he's been out in the field working, verse 16. And uh, so he invites him to his home. And uh, and I ask him where he is, verse 18. He said, we're passing from Bethlehem in Judea to the remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, for I am from there. I went there to... The, in Bethlehem, but now I'm going back to my house. No one will take me into his house. And this is a sign of the deterioration. Because in those days, and it was required hospitality. And here you have a fellow Jew from one of the tribes. And nobody invites him in. And this old man says, well... Uh, I, you know, he tells the old man, you know, I have my own stuff. I brought provisions. I can take care of my animals. So it's not like I'll be a burden. Uh, verse 19, there's, I have the food for the donkeys and my own bread and wine. And uh, for those that are traveling with me. So there's no lack of anything. The end of verse 19. So there's no reason. This is all told why. A reminder that there. The deterioration just isn't in one area. Here's an Israelite city, and here it would be a minor inconvenience because people those days were used to. And often when you invite the stranger in, you took upon yourself to feed them and take care of them. But here, this man saying, I've got everything for myself. Anybody can buy, could see what he has. And the, the old man said in verse 20, you come into my home, and you know what he says, let me take care of all your needs. Because it was almost, you know, offensive if you weren't able to do that. Uh, only don't spend the night in the open square. And, you know, it's not just, it won't be comfortable, it's not safe. So he took him into his house, takes care of his animals, and provides for them while they were celebrating, verse 22. The men of the city, certain worthless money uh, fellows, surrounded the house, pounded the doors, spoke to the owner of the house, the old man saying, bring out the man who come into your house that we may have relation to him. Sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah. We didn't go through all the account because it's so familiar. Um, same scenario. Uh, yet we're in a tribe of Israel. The tribe of Benjamin. An Israelite city in that tribe. Uh, and he makes the same offer as Lot did. Verse 24, here's my virgin daughter and his concubine. Do to them what you would. I mean, something we can hardly even uh, identify with. But uh, see the uh, protection. But these men aren't interested in anything natural. We've gone beyond that. You know, that's what sin does. You know, it's like a drug. Uh, a little bit to start is okay, but now I need more and something different. And the natural no longer is appealing. It's only the unnatural. You know, why are people drawn to sin? It's just something about doing the wrong thing. And we know that because we were born in sin. We are conceived in sin and from our birth we go astray. And the longer we go astray, the more corrupted and corruptible we are. Um, the men wouldn't listen to him. So the man takes his concubine, and he had come because she had been unfaithful, so he was bringing her back. He, she's his rightful possession. He pushes her out the door and closes the door. And so the men do turn their lustful desires on her. And most of you are familiar with the account. Uh, in the morning, he gets ready to leave, goes out. And uh, the woman had come when the men were done with her and fell down at the doorway, and she's dead. Verse 27, when her master arose in the morning, opened the doors of the house, went out, 
to go on his way. Then the oldest the concubine was laying on the doorway of the house. And he said to her, get up, let's go. Rather callous. And he, but she's dead. So he puts her on her donkey, takes her home, and you're aware, cuts her into 12 pieces, sends a piece of her body all to all the 12 tribes. And uh, the other tribes gather together. And to summarize it, they want the guilty men of that tribe of Benjamin, but the tribe of Benjamin won't give them up. In other words, we're going to protect them, and they do. And they go to war. Now you're going to have a lot of opponents. Isn't it amazing what, the, what sin does to you? The tribe of Benjamin almost gets totally wiped out of men. Um, because they go to battle and, you know, the one against the 11 can't win. 10 uh, here can't win. So, boy, there's just a few, relatively few, if you will, men of Benjamin survive. Think of this. It's not that there were these kind of sinful people in this particular city of Gibeah in the tribe of Benjamin, But the tribe will go and give their lives to defend these men who are guilty of that crime. I mean, uh, I want to think, well, you know, why did God record these things so we could see ugly stories? No, it's a reminder of what sin is like and the consequences of sin. And the judgment comes. Come over. uh, I'm going to take these out of order to what I have. Um, Come to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's just a little bit of the Old Testament. We could have looked at other things, but it's enough to give you the idea. We come to the church age. The world hasn't changed. Now, thankfully, there is what we call the common grace of God. Um, It's a grace that restrains and refrains uh, sin, holds it back. Uh, Otherwise, the world would be so overrun, it would be unlivable. Uh, We came to in the days of Noah when God wiped it out with the flood. Um, but there is a restraining influence going on. But uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Paul writing about the law. We know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane, For those who would kill their parents. I mean, we see that in the news. For murderers, immoral men, homosexuals, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I've been entrusted. I mean, we're not under the Mosaic law. But we don't want to miss the lessons that are taught in the Mosaic Law. And sin is still sin. And he gives examples of sin here. Um, Why you need the Word of God as a standard that restrains sin. Uh, That's what it was to do in Israel. And the more Israel neglected God's Word... Remember, it got so neglected that when they were remodeling the temple, they didn't even have a copy of God's uh, law until it was discovered in a remodeling project. How did you get to that point? You know, less and less it's important. Less and less it's used. Less and less it becomes a focal point of worship. So, less and less. I remember some dear friends uh, say back in the 70s, you know, George and Linda Stroh, and he shared the testimony. First time he came to Indian Hills in the 70s, uh, he said to his wife, 
Look, everybody here carries a hymn, a, a hymn book. Because it never dawned them they carried a Bible. Because he assumed it must, they must bring their own hymn books. You know, what has happened to the church? You know, when our family attended a denominational church that was associated with John Wesley, we didn't have to take our Bibles because it wasn't used. Sometimes the pastor could refer to it or quote something, but you didn't have to have a Bible with you. How does it get to there? Well, little by little, churches give Bible lectures instead of Bible studies. And we just use verses of the Bible to support our talks as we tell people how to do better in their jobs and how to do better with their families and how to do this and how to do that. And then pretty soon, it's just the formality of going through certain actions and having talks that people like to hear. Um, how are you going to know what God's standards are? Um, what are we filling our hearts and minds with if it's not with the Word of God? Uh, come back to 1 Corinthians. We're going backwards here from the back toward the front. But these are letters to churches. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to verse 9. Look at what he has to say to the Corinthians. Verse 9. Or do you not know? Now we've seen that a number of times that we've uh, studied the scripture together you go down to verse 15 while you're in chapter 6 and just note how verse 15 begins do you not know look at verse 16 or do you not know or verse 19 or do you not know what is Paul challenging it's like Jesus said to the Jewish leaders of his day have you never read the Old Testament in Matthew 19. In the beginning, God made them male and female. What's the problem? Well, they read it, but it wasn't part of their life anymore. And if you read it, you close it up, and you go and do your own thing. Here he has to write to the church at Corinth, and we just looked at this small sample back up in verse 3. Do you not know? Look at back at verse 2 in chapter 6. Do you not know? I mean, it's like you tell your children when they do something foolish, stupid, wrong. Don't you know any better? It's not a question you're expecting an answer. There's no excuse for them not knowing. I mean, what are you doing? Uh, what is wrong? You're living like you don't know. If you had said this, oh, oh yeah, I know that. But it's not making any difference in your life. You're not doing what it says. There's the problem. You're living like you don't know. That's where Israel came. That's what Jesus confronts the Jewish leaders. Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. But he wasn't a believer. Until Christ took a hold of him on the Damascus Road. What are you doing? You're a Pharisee. You grow up learning the scriptures. But pretty soon they're not relevant in our lives. That's the danger of not obeying the word of God. Pretty soon it's just an intellectual knowledge. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I know. And we've memorized Bible. But when it comes to the carrying out of the word, this was the Corinthians' problem. So Paul has to keep saying, don't you know? Don't you know? What did he have to tell him in chapter 3? I can't write to you as mature people. As godly people. I have to feed you like you're that little baby. You can't handle the milk of the word. What have you been doing? I remember early in my time at Lincoln, I was speaking at a meeting of evangelical churches. And I just used the passage of scripture for what I've been doing at church. And one of the men who was a leader in an evangelical come up to me and says, do you always give your people that much meat? Well, 
They come to eat. What do you expect? I mean, he was saying it like, I, I can't believe you study the Word. You, you go into the Word like that? I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do? What are churches doing? We're the pillar and support of the truth. Do you not know? We're here for verse 9, but you got my mini-sermon with it. Do you not know? Now, this is serious. That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. When Christ comes and sets up his kingdom, the unrighteous won't go into that kingdom. You have to be born again, remember Jesus told Nicodemus, or you'll never see the kingdom. Do not be deceived. Now, you see, this is what I was talking about earlier today. We begin to get shaped by the world, then our thinking comes from our emotions. So our emotions lead us. And we begin to act on how we feel, not thinking biblically. And one of the reasons we go through the Word of God carefully and in detail is so that we learn to think biblically. So then it is applied as it should. Don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Evidently, you know what happened to the Corinthian church? Over time, the thinking of the world had come in and sin was no longer that serious. And the church, that's why, they've got all kinds of problems. They're fighting with each other. There's divisions. Oh, that's back early in the letter. It was chapter 3. I couldn't speak to you on the more serious doctrines of the word because you're not ready to handle it. You're like that little baby that has to have the easily digested things that are broken down for them. You know, you don't give them something solid they can't handle. He says, that's what the Corinthian church is like. The problem is, that's one thing when you got that little baby. It's another thing when you got this 20-year-old. I mean, it's, something's wrong. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. You know, the church doesn't believe that. And if we're honest, some of us don't believe it. Well, I know they're saved. They're just not living. Well, you know what God says? If you're not living it, you don't belong to me. Oh, no, I know they try. How do you know? I'm going to talk about this a little bit in our discussion a little later. How do you know? Well, they gave me their testimony. Oh, really? Well, what's their testimony? Well, when I was in third grade... Uh, I prayed a prayer with my parents or my Sunday school teacher, and uh, I trusted Christ. Yeah, and how's your life been? Well, you know, I'm not living for the Lord, and I'm involved in maybe some of these sins, but, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a Christian. I just maybe not living like I should. Who says you can be call yourself a Christian and not live like you should? You don't get that out of the Word of God. I mean, well, we're too nice to be too direct. Now, I'm not saying a Christian can't sin. We have examples of that. David leaps out to us. But David wasn't parked there. There's a period of his life there. But, you know, you can't live there and call yourself a Christian. Oh, you're making works part of salvation. Yes. No one is saved whose life is not lived for the Lord. Now, a believer can get off track. And that's why believers go and confront them. Matthew 18, as we've looked at. To bring them back. They can be wandering sheep. But the people that live out there and like it out there aren't wandering sheep. They're people that don't belong. 
They belong out there. They're comfortable out there. They like it out there. They like being what they are. Then we have the mixture, and this was a Corinthian church. They still want to be viewed as Christians. I still want to be viewed as, you know, I know that's true. In 50 years of ministry in this church and a few years before I came here, I've sat and talked to people and had these discussions. You're sitting here telling me you know you're a Christian. Just what in their life, outside of the fact you have a testimony at this point, your life 15 years ago, you trusted Christ. What is there in your life that would make me think you're a believer? By your own testimony, you live in rebellion against God. You're doing the kind of things talked about here. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, swindlers. You know, and then the other lists, other things. We have to tell the church, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, well, it's if God credits his righteousness to me, yes. And when he does that, It's in the conjunction of washing you and setting you free. And now you live differently. Um, You see, encompassed here. So can you be a Christian and practice these things? No. Can you commit these sins? Yes. Be very careful. But if you find yourself living that life, you better, you know, I've, as bystander steal people can tell you this is what Gil will tell you if you go see him Um, and other believers in the church this is what they'll tell you that's what that church is like they'll tell you well you have to trust Christ and when you trust Christ you have to stop the sin yes that's why I couldn't make a living in counseling I'd have to charge several thousand dollars a session because it's not that complicated Here's what the Bible says. Here's what you must do. And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it means you let go of everything and submit yourself to him. Um, God's not, let's, let's negotiate, God. I want to be forgiven my sins. Be sure I'm not going to hell. I'm not willing to give up this and this, but I will give up this and this. You know, it's like our, you know, uh, government's supposed to work. Well, you negotiate. God doesn't negotiate. He tells you. Now he says, let's reason together. Let me tell you what I'll do for you. But it's not, well, you know, Lord, I am willing to let go of everything place my faith in you and call you my Lord and Savior. Why would you call me Lord if you don't do what I tell you? All right, you see what's included here. The issues, you know, I want to be honest. Homosexuals are not going to heaven. Uh, Adulterers aren't going to heaven. Thieves aren't going to heaven. Covetous aren't going to heaven. Drunkards aren't going to heaven. We call going to heaven and ultimately uh, the eternal form of the kingdom will be heaven. Um, So, you know, if you're not going in the kingdom, uh, you're not going to be saved. That's what Jesus said. Unless you're born again, You'll never see the kingdom. And now the Spirit of God directs Paul to write, if you practice these things, you're not going to be part of the kingdom. Is he saying anything different than Jesus said? You must be born again. Born again people don't do these things. That doesn't mean you can't commit acts of sin. We do. But when this is the pattern of your life, come back to Romans chapter 1. We're studying Romans on Sunday night as our normal study. Um, But we don't want to forget where we start, Romans. Paul says in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 16. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's what we need, God's power. We're not telling people to clean up their lives. 
God doesn't tell people to clean up their lives. He says, I'm going to clean you up so that now you can lead a clean life. Because it's the heart that's the problem. It's the source of the sin. Jesus said in Mark 7, it's out of the heart all these sinful things come. Because as Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Cleaning up the outside of the cup doesn't do anything. Jesus said the religious people of his day that wouldn't think of doing some of these things were just whitewashed tombs um, in the inside filled of dead men's bones. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The wrath of God in verse 18. You can have the righteousness of God or you get the wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What do they do? They suppress the truth. I mean, in their hearts, they know how come we've come through millennials of time and all civilizations of all kind have known the difference between a man and a woman, a male and a female, boy and a girl. But now we don't. We suppress the truth. Even the most obvious truth, we are unwilling to acknowledge anymore. That's why we come sliding down that slope and we crash at the bottom and it's time for God's judgment. Uh, where do you go? I mean, well, next step is we have to wipe out everybody who disagrees with us, who would imply this is wrong, this is sin. There is a holy God who will judge us. We can't have that. Um, so he goes on and note uh, there without excuse, the end of verse 20. Um, they knew God. They didn't honor him as God. It's a progressive downslope. Our country at a time, Time Magazine, 30, 30, 35 years ago, I forget now what, had the cover story, the year of the evangelical. And the truth of the gospel was more broadly disseminated. We've had that through our country. And going back to its founding, truth was there. Not saying the founders were true believers. But the word of God was disseminated and encouraged. And, uh, but men rejected it. They didn't honor God, verse 21, or give thanks, so they became futile in their speculations. Their hearts darkened. They worshiped the creation, not the creator, in verse 23. So God gave them over. This is the serious thing about rejecting God, persisting in the rejection. I alluded to this when we were at Isaiah, a time of salvation. Um, Paul saying, today is the day. You continue to tell God no. Continue in the rebellion. There comes a time when he gives you over to the sin. Gives you over to the rebellion. Now, I don't know that. I've led people to the Lord in their 90s. Uh, they had a life of rebellion. So I'm not the judge of that. And how God works, his purposes are his. But it's a dangerous thing to keep telling God, no, I won't. Uh, because you may say that for the last time. And then what? What is left? Judgment. Well, I thought I would do it tomorrow. Well, God didn't say I'd let you do it tomorrow. I told you today is the day of salvation. So God gave them over. And what do they do? They, verse 25, exchange the truth of God for a lie. What does that mean? Where do you get your truth from? You know, we've come to the point where everybody makes their own truth because they see themselves as their own God. They're no acknowledging the true and living God who is truth. And what is the manifestation of that? God gave them over. You don't want to live in rebellion against me, degrading yourself? Verse 26, he gave them over to degrading passions, women with women, men with men, and... There's a penalty for that. They don't want to acknowledge God any longer. Verse 20, God gave them over to a depraved mind. They're filled with all unrighteousness. And then look at the list. 
And we pick out things, well, some of these aren't so bad. Uh, you know, murder, that's a bad one. Um, strife, well, <laughs> that's just part of life. Um, deceit, gossips. I mean, evangelical church never has gossip. Aren't you glad of that? We wouldn't tolerate that sin. Um, I have Baptist background. Even the Baptists joke about conflict, battles, divisions, slanderers. You know, right next after slanderers, haters of God. I don't know about slandering somebody. Is that on the same level as hating God? That's what God does, lumps these things together. Insolent, arrogant, boastful, disobedient to parents, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. They know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, they give hearty approval to those who do them. We pass laws to support them. Um, What does that say? You're just as guilty as the person doing it. We have people that sit there, I wouldn't do that, but I defend their right to do it. What do you mean, their right to do it? Their right to defy God. I'm not saying Christianity ought to be established as the religion of the country, but I have to then be the spokesman that your sin will lead you to an eternal hell. I don't know, it doesn't matter if the Supreme Court passes a law. Well, men can marry men. We have to recognize that. You've put yourself over God. The people would choose to obey you. The one you obey is the one you worship. That's why the people who refuse to obey God... What do they do? Who are they worshiping? The God that they won't obey? Uh, The multi-volume Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Where you go when you want the last word on Greek words. It's not totally reliable, but uh, it is the most exhaustive. In other words, Lord, Koryos. And I say, well, the reason any concept of God has to include... The requirement of submitting to him. I'm paraphrasing their uh, extensive discussion. I mean, you call him Lord, but you won't do what he says. Just what Jesus said. Why would you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Is God Lord of all? Then what right do I have to rebel against him in any area? I mean, what did he say here? It's insolence. It's arrogance. I mean, all this, but this is how it begins to infiltrate in the church. Well, we don't see these things as, I just think, and all these, what we call vice lists in the New Testament, God just mixes them up. He doesn't put, well, this is level one. This is level two. This is level three. This is level four. And so we have the baddies up here. Do you know why? Any sin is a manifestation of what? A rejection of God's authority in my life. That's why it's so serious. I'm telling God, no. Just like that little two-year-old that'll stand there and say, no. Over what? Doesn't matter. Whatever the issue, he's defying you as the authority in his life as the parent. I mean, so in that sense, little sins, big sins. I'm not saying, well, you might as well go out and murder someone because you've lied about something else. Obviously not. But all sin is of the same character. It is a rebellious act against God. That's what makes it so serious. And when we don't think it's serious to rebel against God, then our foundation is eroding and the church is deteriorating. And that's where it begins with me. Where am I? Am I comfortable with things in my life that I know God wouldn't? I have people who come. I remember one dear man's home with the Lord now. He came in to ask me, do you think God wants me to do? And he mentioned what? And we're going to get to this in Romans 14. But I said, let me ask you a question. Do you think God wants you to do? 
what you're doing. Well, no, I don't think God wants me to do it. Well, it really doesn't matter what I think, does it? I mean, why would you care about my opinion when you already have decided you're doing what you know God doesn't want you to do? If you don't think God wants you to do it, you better get out of my office and do whatever it takes to stop doing it, right? And he did. I mean, isn't that it? And here I look through these sins and I say, well, I've said some things about other people I shouldn't say. I've done this, I've done, but I haven't done any of the big ones. No, we all stumble in many ways. James says that. But I never want to be comfortable with my stumblings because you know what that is? I become comfortable with a stumbled life. I want to be sensitive. And when I do do something that I know is a sin, rebellious, I want that to bother me. I don't want to go to bed and be comfortable with that. I don't want to just get on. I want to know I'm not going to do it. Why did I do that? And I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to sit in a puddle and all oh my uh, sin, what do I, I'm going to acknowledge it was sin and the mess ability, I'm not going to make it a practice in my life. All right, so that's where these sins are. The world, more and more what the Bible calls sin is what the world calls acceptable behavior that we ought to defend. We're defending sin with the laws that are passed, with the actions that are taken. We can't go there. Sin is sin. So this is where we will come into conflict with the government. I'm not saying everybody ought to and has to obey what we believe in the Bible because they're not believers. But I cannot submit myself to their authority when it's contrary to the Bible. But it is hypocrisy for them to say, oh, no, I can't submit to you on that. And if they examine my life, oh, yeah, but you're comfortable to rebel against these other things that God says you shouldn't do. Um, so I don't want to be that kind of hypocrite. Well, that then denies what I say is true. I want to live truth, not just talk it. Let's pray together, and then I want to talk about a related area. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your word, and Lord, uh, your work of salvation is finished in us but not complete and in these bodies uh, in this world Lord if we're not careful we do stumble but Lord we want to grow and mature we don't want to stumble and stumble and stumble and stumble and our life is just a collection of stumbles Lord we want to grow and mature and learn and become more and more like you become conformed to you because we're partakers of your nature, your character. Bless us as we continue to discuss. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to apply and connect this to some emails uh, and concerns expressed. You know, things go on below the surface. I was asked if I would express this in an email, uh, in a Q&A uh, in an email I received just this week. But it has come up before. Where you have situations in a home where one of the people in the home is not living a godly life, but they're accepted in the church as godly people. And it was, what do I do? I've talked to my spouse. I'll leave it at that. Um, but they continue to persist in that behavior. In that conduct, um, my understanding, and where it comes to, if that's the persistent behavior, you probably begin to look at it as an unbeliever. We don't have time to go to the verses that I was going to take you to, but First John chapter three, you read that. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Those who practice sin are of the devil. Those who practice righteousness belong to God. We aren't to be deceived by these things. So a person can put on a good front, talk a good talk. You know, they reveal what they're like when they're not here. 
had a professor I've shared with you before, way back in Bible college days. And it was a class of men. He says, men, what you are when you are alone is what you are. Not what you are when you come to this class. And that was a thing I never forgot. What you are in your home is what you are. How you treat your spouse is what you are. They don't cover that up. Well, I have people in the church that think I'm a godly person. Yeah, you're good at fooling people. Amazes me and you know, makes me even more sure, or maybe I should say more doubtful of the genuineness of their salvation when you think you could fool God. And you're more concerned about fooling other people than you are fooling God. So for people in this situation, I'd say you, James says, faith without works is dead. You're not saved by your works. But a supposed faith that does not result in a changed life is not saving faith. So if you're married to a person, this is their life and their lifestyle. You may not want to bring it out before the church. That's the thing you have to decide. You know, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, there addresses wives who may be living with an unbelieving spouse. You don't nag him to death. Um, you be godly as much as you can, trusting that maybe God will use your testimony in his life for his salvation. Paul uses the same kind of argument in 1 Corinthians 7, where a believer is married to an unbeliever and says, well, if they're willing to live with you. Now, this doesn't mean you have to live with them. It says, if they don't want to live with you as a believer, let them go. You're not bound to that if they make the choice. But don't give up. Don't be looking for a way to leave. Um, concentrate on being godly and maybe God will use your... So that's the way I'd say, if it's the kind of sin, if they were coming to be considered for a position, teaching a position of responsibility, um, and so on, elder, deacon, or other area you probably would have to come and talk to an elder about their conduct or a deacon. And it would have come to the elders. Um, you don't want to cover for them. But neither do you want to be the one telling everybody you come in contact with what a bad person your spouse is. Because that's not a biblical solution. God doesn't say that's the answer. Well, I want everybody to know how bad he is, how bad she is. Well, Why? So people know how godly I am in living with that bad person. Well, then I'm not a very godly person. You know, God, give me the grace. What's the other person going to do about it? It doesn't mean you can't talk to a godly person if you need counsel and you want somebody. To, but be careful. Sometimes it just becomes an excuse to let other people know for your good. And we do seek Bible advice, and we should go to godly people to seek. But what are we looking for? Sometimes I ask, well, what do you want me to do? What do you plan to do here? I mean, why are you here to tell me this? Uh, do you want me to talk to them? I'm willing to do that. Well, I don't know I want you to do that. Um... Do you want to take somebody with you? Well, no, not right now. Um, are you thinking of divorcing them? Oh, no. Well, so I have to decide, why am I talking about this? If it's not going to go anywhere, sometimes, as the song says, tell it to the Lord in prayer. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. Because what's this person going to do? I unload on them. Now they've got all these thoughts about how bad my spouse is. But what are they supposed to do with it? Pass it on to someone else? And now we move into the gossip line. So somehow we have to decide first, if I'm a godly person, am I being? Because maybe... And you'll understand this, right? Marilyn had to marry me because God was going to use me to refine her. If she had married a perfect man, how was she going to grow? 
She wasn't perfect. I was. No. You know, sometimes we miss. Lord, this is the husband you gave me. This is the wife. I want to be as godly a person as I can be in this situation. I want to be the husband to her that you would have me be. Because in this, I'm concerned about your approval. I want to be the wife to him that you would want me to be so I have your approval, Lord. And we work through that. That doesn't mean I can, it'll, it'll solve it. In some, it can't be worked out. But I would say if that's the practice of your spouse to live an ungodly life, goes out, drinks, and does things that a godly person wouldn't do, you're probably living with an ungodly person. And he's probably got the people in the church or she's got the people in the church fooled. But God's not fooled. Um, and again, it's not wrong to talk to a godly person, uh, to pray with them, to have them encourage you, but be careful. Because, and I've told people, they want to tell me something. I said, I said person, I want to tell you something, but you can't tell anyone else. I said, stop. What am I supposed to do with you? What will you tell me? Well, I just want you to know I don't need to know something that I can't do anything with. I can't do anything about. You know, put that in my mind so now that I'm going to roll this over and think about it. I never do. I, I don't know what that person wanted to tell me. Hey, somebody bring me a whole folder of stuff they wanted me to know about. I said, look, I give it back. There's nothing I can do with that. The situation you're telling me that this involves, I have nothing to do with, and I have no part to play. It's not even part of our church. I, I, my, my year's not a garbage can. You know, just for people to dump and feel better. Now, that doesn't mean there are things that, yeah, we need to talk about. I just say, you can have people pray for you. Sometimes the best thing to say is, you know, I'm trying to work on some things. Because you can't change your spouse. Marilyn can't change me. I can't change her. The biggest impact she has on changing me, areas where I need to grow, is being the woman that God wants her to be. And for me, that's what I do. That doesn't guarantee that the other person is going to change because nobody can change anyone else. You know? It's... But my concentration, so often it comes... People want to talk about what's wrong with the person that they don't think is functioning right. Well, if that's all you got to talk about, how is God using this in your life? Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into all kinds of trials. Because those trials refine you, perfect you. So, you know, the first thing I want to think about is how can I be more in this situation what God would want me to be? You know, I see it as that. That's the first thing I say. Well, what would God want you to do? What, how can you be more that? Because until I've dealt with that, all I get so concerned about what she's not doing, what he's not doing, I can't, I can't go on. Why? In other words, if God, if you don't make my life better, I can't do what you want me to do. God never puts me in a situation where I can't do and be what he wants me to be. He never causes me to sin. And James warns about that. We never want to get in a position we blame God. And that's where coming up with excuses, well, they do this, they do that, so that's why I'm not what I ought to be. There's never an excuse why I'm not what I ought to be. Why I'm not doing. Never an excuse. Uh, other people might think, oh, yeah, well, that's understandable that you didn't do the right thing. I don't think I'd do the right thing. What's God saying? That I put you in a situation? That I didn't give you the grace to enable you to handle it? Well, my friend didn't think I could handle it and should. Well, where do we go? That's where the first thing I go to is, Lord, refine me, perfect me. And when I'm being everything I can be that God wants me to be, then he'll be using me in a greater way.
All right, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Again, Lord, thank you that it's clear. Uh, Sometimes we wander. We're prone to wander. Uh, We make excuses for ourselves. So easy to see the faults and failures in others and to be blind to our own. The proverbial log that your word warns us about. We see the speck in other people's eyes and uh, we're blind to our own faults. Or do we want to grow together? We want to help one another to grow. We want to support and encourage one another. Lord, often we don't know the trials that those that we have contact with are going through. But we can be praying for one another. We can be encouraging one another even though we don't know everything. And Lord, when we become aware of things, Lord, may we be a help in a way that you can use. Instruments that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, works through us in their lives. So we commit ourselves to that end, the week before us, and all the situations we'll face, and the pressures, the trials, the blessings. May we honor you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.